Design Drinks edition with the topic of designing services for the public. But before we dive deeper into that topic, I would like to hand over to Jochen. Do I have to climb over that? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's an effort. And he'll share a few bits about Fjord. Yeah, and, uh, I will be quick and brief, so don't worry. So again, a very warm welcome to uh, our brand new, still brand new, Fjord Berlin Studio. We are glad to have you here tonight. Uh, my name is Jochen, I'm Program Director at Fjord. And just in case you're not familiar with Fjord, so we are a uh, design and innovation consultancy. Here in the Berlin Studio, we are about 50 really great designers, plus an even greater studio dog. And uh, around the globe, we have, yeah, I think, 600 people spread across uh, 15 studios from Hong Kong, London, New York to Sao Paulo. So, yes, we do really nice uh, international projects and we do really cool, disruptive and differentiating projects for these international clients. And, uh, yes, we do hire, just in case. <laughs> so, let me know. Um, so, again, warm welcome. Uh, we have three drinks over there. Uh, so please use them and uh, enjoy your evening. Have fun. Yeah, so that's one of the other features of the service design drinks. So we are wandering throughout the city. So we'll be, we are hosting events at very different locations such as Fjord. And yeah, so next time we'll see each other at a different place. But we are not only gathering locally here in Berlin, we are also trying to share the love beyond the boundaries of our beautiful city. And actually, Mao will be in charge of broadcasting this input tonight. Um, in case you can't be here for another event, um, tune in next time. So who are we actually to talk about this, um, this topic? So besides being colleagues at Service Design Berlin, Martin and I are also well, close to the topic that we'll be talking about today. Um, in my day job, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Potsdam, looking at how design thinking is implemented in the public sector. Um, yeah, for me it's a bit more complicated because my day job is actually spending some 40 plus hours at, at Nokia, at their local um, mapping um, unit. But in the other hours, in the night, uh, I'm uh, studying um, in Laurea University in Finland um, with an MBA program, um, and they're looking uh, into public service innovation. So that's my, my view on it. So far from us. Um, before we actually give you more input from our part, um, we would like you to become a little bit more active, warm up to the topic, and also get to know the people in the room. So we ask you to interview your neighbor for two minutes on the question, what was your last positive interaction with a governmental service? It starts now and we'll let you know when to switch.
So I hope you, you've been warming up to the topic a little bit. We'll get back to that um, at the end of our input. Um, and as you discussed and realized, public services cover a wide range. There are very different kinds of public services. And just to show a few examples, sectors that ranges from healthcare to social services, public libraries, public transport, even water supply and waste management. Um, but what are we talking about when we talk about public service? Um, we want to share a very simple definition of what a public service is. It's namely a service which is provided by government to people living within its jurisdiction. And that is either directly through the government or um, by financing private provision of services. Could be, for example, in the educational sector or the care sector, where actually a third party provides the service and government um, subsidies um, that. Martin and I have recently been... Gets us into the mood of drinks. <laughs> um, Martin and I have recently been to a conference on this very topic, namely Politics of Tomorrow, Innovative Approaches in Policymaking, and we want to share a few snippets of what we discussed during this conference. Um, and what we can say is that much is already happening globally and especially in Europe. There are a lot of innovation government labs out there. Some of them have been around for almost a decade, such as MindLab in Denmark. Um, some of them are more recent, such as GabLab in Chile. And these are actually trying to foster innovation within the government um, internally. So really innovation groups, innovation teams set up to yeah, kickstart things um, in a more innovative um, setting. And Germany still has to catch up. Um, I mean, that's why we are here today, that's why we want to continue this conversation. Um, what's important, I think, overall is that um, to innovate in the public sector, we need to bring together all kinds of stakeholders. And as government, um, yeah, government has to ask itself, who is it collaborating with? Not only citizens, but, you know, third party providers of services and actually bringing all these people together. And this also means that the role of government is changing um, from being public servants as the experts, providing services, um, knowing better um, what people actually want, um, towards a role that is more that of a facilitator, moderator. But that also means that the role of citizens is changing um, from mere uh, service recipients to playing a more active part. And also, I think another idea that was discussed is what we can call government in beta. And that means how can we actually enable prototyping and testing in a, in a safe environment? I mean, if we think about public services, um, they cater to almost everybody out there. They cater to vulnerable people. And how can we make sure that actually a culture of experimenting can take place in a way that's still safe and, you know, not... Uh, Havoking, causing havoc <laughs> in the whole system. And another important factor with all this, um, especially in the case of Germany, where a lot of public servants have a background um, in law, I think is internal capability building. If we think about new approaches, um, design-led approaches, design methods, and then that means we need to build internal capabilities within government to actually make these things happen. <laughs> okay, and now we dig a little bit deeper what public, uh, into what public service design means. Exactly. So, um, because one, one question you might ask, like, why, why are suddenly designers messing with government? <laughs> right? um, I mean, well, as Catherine already started touching, one thing is like really meeting needs, and not only meeting um, user needs and citizen needs, but as well um, having, having, having a broader, way broader um, view. That's magic. Um, yeah, meeting meeting way broader needs, and, and designers have the capabilities to understand, um, do stakeholder mapping, and all these kind of stand, uh, all of these kind of things, and um, zoom out and and understand what other stakeholders um, actually um, 
uh, expecting um, regarding outcomes. Um, and another big, big thing, of course, is saving money. On the one hand, Germany uh, is not really facing that problem so much. Mr. Schäuble is getting more and more um, tax income, especially this year, as we recently learned. But in other parts of Europe, it's it's not in, not looking that bright. So um, in, in the UK, there's rather the the, the the tax income for the government like going down, and then therefore they are they are trying to um, um, well consolidate different ministries. And even in, even Germany, there there are various various hundreds of um, 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 public servants looking into what they call bureaucratie about, right? And then eventually as well about uh, questioning all the structures that are there in order to uh, save money. And then, well, one thing of course is as well making services more more um, fitting for, for for human beings because um, people do feel. Um, but often treated as, as numbers and not as, as human beings, right? So, and with a human-centered design approach, we have the capabilities um, of, of designing for this, um, for this uh, different approach. And, of course, um, engaging, engaging citizens, um, because with the, with the um, and I think this is something to, um, we can observe all over Europe, that the trust in um, democratic uh, countries is, not the ideal state, but in the moment we are able, as Kevin was touching us as well, um, if we are able to to re-engage with citizens, well, we can make we can make a, a way a way um, better country and a way better Europe actually. And one quote we've been um, taking note of um, at the Politics of Tomorrow conference was actually from um, was uh, Sabina Junge. She said like we don't um, only need politics for tomorrow, but as well as citizenship. Tomorrow. So, how can we, as as citizens, um, engage in these processes? How can we part of yeah of these um, government and, and beta tests? Um, how can we contribute? How can we um, be um, uh, integrated very early um, when policy making is actually taking place? Um, and um, um, another um, fellow, uh, um, Adam Walter, said, "Well, um, the challenges we face is uh, people's expectations are going up." Um, while governmental um, budgets are going down. Um, and especially when we talk about like um, digital governmental um, offerings, well, we are used to have like great user experiences with using um, Facebook and Twitter and so on. And there are like many, many designers taking care of all little micro interactions. And then, well, you use the, the application of uh, the government and you're like, wow, this is just a really shitty experience, to be honest. And then, um, while, while um, doing some studies, realizing, for example, um, for the for the German um, e ID card, the, the iOS app was just de uh, uh, de it was it was taken off the App Store because they are reworking it. So I mean, imagine like Twitter or also like pulling off their services for a while until they they do a new version. So it's a it's a very different different mindset. Um, well, and then looking into the usage of overall. Um, digital offerings um, in Europe, um, it's interesting to see if we, for example, say, hey, how many Europeans are actually having their Facebook account? And this is this is actually a number that is overall uh, representative for Europe as well for Germany. So Germany is is at some 35%, but in other uh, parts of Europe, um, like uh, UK or Portugal, it's, it's at 50%. 50% of all um, of the population are having a Facebook account and going up uh, in Iceland, even up to like 70%. Um, then looking at another number, um, which is like you, uh, citizens using um, e-governmental um, offerings. Um, um, and uh, this is actually a number that, that even went in the past few years um, that went down um, and is sort of stable, uh, stable at this 40, 41%. Um, but then we have as well those forerunners um, in other parts of Europe, uh, mainly um, like one of one of the um, uh, lighthouses, basically in Estonia, were actually um, amazing. 90, uh, Ninety-four percent of the users have eID cards, and they're using this for for kind of e-voting, and um, all kind of um, service offerings are being being used uh, with their personal device with their um, electronic ID cards. So what we see there is actually that there is, as Philip Navarro was saying, it, 
there's a global contest to lead the next revolution in governments, because suddenly um, governmental interfaces are competing for business uh, business people um, coming um, to their countries, right? Like um, there's now this um, e Estonia um, e citizenship, so people uh, sitting in France can say, hey, I want to start a business, and maybe um, because for tax reasons, maybe for for interface reasons, I'm going actually to Estonia. Um, and not physically, just virtually, and open my business there. So suddenly, governments are in a, in a way different uh, competition uh, they haven't been facing in the 20th century. Um, and then there was an interesting study earlier this year conducted by a McKinsey company um, asking Germans what are the reasons for not using um, e government um, offerings. Well, and <laughs> um, having 80% of uh, usability issues there. Um, or uh, yeah, preferring personal touch points because the digital, digital touch points are just so bad. Well, this, this uh, speaks, speaks quite a lot. And then, and this is really like almost embarrassing, right? That, that, that the um, citizens say they are missing IT experience. Come on, this shouldn't be the case at all. Um, and then, in contrast, you have offerings uh, in the UK, a uh, service so that that is still sort of fresh. Which is um, Gulf UK, where um, people have like one a uh, one stop shop, one interface that is bringing together all ministries, and you're able to renew um, your driver's license. You're able to um, look into like tax benefits. It's everything in one place. And like as a as a mental exercise, like one evening, I tried to find out like why I can change uh, just just the uh, my address. Uh, um, moving within Berlin, and like I ended up on on websites like Behördenfinder and so on. So you have like um, um, a website that tries to list like all the different agencies that might be around, and then you have to enter where are you because it, it differs from from the, the city you are in, and it's such a mess compared. But we're going to hear some more positive examples from Katrin now. I actually wanted to share another anecdote. I recently heard that it's easier to register a car in Germany than to register a child, which is also quite telling, I guess. But um, getting more to the positive examples, I would like to share a few um, of how design is actually applied in the public sector. And the first example brings me to Denmark. Um, I already mentioned MindLab as a government lab in Denmark. And they were facing the challenge of how can we better assist young job seekers. Um, and let's take a look behind the scenes. What did they actually do? Um, MindLab conducted a user study with, um, for the Danish Employment Agency to understand the young um, unemployed people better. And they used um, methods such as um, qualitative research and ethnographic interviews, shadowing to better to really get a grip of the needs of the users. Um, and then subsequently, um, they came up with a concept for a digital mentoring program that um, better engaged uh, these young job seekers. This is really an example of how user research was practically uh, applied in a government lab. Um, I brought another example from the UK, the Alzheimer 100 project. This was a project um, that um, revol uh, revolved around the challenge of how can we improve the dementia patient experience. And um, I brought this example because um, it represents co-design and how co-design was applied. Um, because they were looking for creative solutions to the challenges presented by Alzheimer's. And again, they started out with user research. They did a lot of storytelling, um, enhanced even by digital tools, um, such as like um, following people with video cameras, even engaging the patients themselves and the carers. Um, they then uh, work with personas to actually distill their findings. And I think what was special about this project, they hosted a number of co-design workshops and eventually um, came up with co-design teams which worked on specific um, service improvements and specific projects. And these were formed by people with dementia, carers and service providers. And um, again, an example of co-design, this really shows that in order to really improve the service experience in this area, um, they needed to bring together all the different stakeholders um, who play part in it. Um, and I brought another example, and 
this is from Singapore. Um, the Ministry of Manpower was um, facing. Um, well, they were there. Okay, to zoom out, Singapore is a financial hub, and they really want to attract um, not only foreign investors but also foreign employees. And they were re trying to rethink um, their work visa application process for foreigners to make it even not even faster but more delightful in a way. And they collaborated um, with IDEO to improve this processing of work passes. And in this project, um, this included also the design of a new service center. And I brought this example um, because it shows that they really use prototyping and testing. And because in the setup of the service center, they used a lot of spatial prototypes. There actually had been a previous design for the service center, but then it was completely remodeled and they set up the counters, the space. They actually had real service walkthroughs before it even opened with user, user scenarios, user testing. And then I think what's even more, I think, amazing from a German standpoint is they actually came up with this new service center in five weeks. I mean, if we think about a lot of public projects here, I mean, this is, I think, uh, far, far away. Um, um, if we look at these examples along the design process, we, I mean, they represent different, uh, different phases. I mean, user research, um, concept formation, co-designing solutions, and also prototyping and testing. But we can also have a look at these examples from another uh, point of view, and this is um, actually uh, the design level pyramid by Steph D. Russo. Um, she, um, well, she has a four four level um, model and describes different uh, well different parts of design and um, starting with the artifacts and again um, getting back to the Singapore example. So they actually redesigned the letter that you get as a foreign citizen um, during the visa application process and making it more human-centered in a way, not just, you know, bureaucratic talk, but really um, having a welcoming message. And that would be an example of the of the bottom layer. It goes up to artifact and experience, so user experience. Um, Martin was talking earlier about finding information on a government website. Um, then it's systems and behavior, and this is where service design is located. And if we um, look back at the service center, this would be like the user flows through the service center. And this goes up to large-scale system design. And in the case of the public sector, this means policy design. So how are concrete services actually reconnected to the policies behind them? Um, but it's not just about methods and artifacts and uh, processes, but innovation in the public sector and design in the public sector also needs the right environmental infrastructure. And I think that two very important building blocks are both resources in terms of money and people, and secondly, also time. I think if we if we look at the public service, a lot of it is operational work. If we look at, um, I mean, the current situation in Berlin, where registering um, refugees is such a big challenge because there's not enough people, and people are preoccupied you know, doing just their core work. How will they have time to rethink their processes and rethink their services? So you need to um, create th those spaces to actually um, engage in, in yeah, rethinking your work and rethinking services. Um, and what's connected to that is um, training and skill development for public servants. I was mentioning it earlier, in Germany especially, a lot of people have a, a law degree. Um, a lot of people who work in the public in the public sector and if we want them to you know become more innovative more creative i mean this means they need to be trained in that area and both building internal capabilities but also maybe engaging out, uh, outside um, experts um, to help them along the way that was enough talking from our part because the service design drinks are not only about um, input, but also making you active and uh, getting you to work. And we've had a little exercise at the beginning, and we would like to get back to this in a second now.
Exactly, because there was a certain reaction from the audience and from all the participants, like a positive experience with a, with a governmental service, really. So maybe maybe this is easier. Um, asking you, um, and we have quite a quite a pile of posters. Would be great to, in a few seconds, like take a note. Like, what was your last interaction with a government service that may need some improvement? And I think everybody should have something in mind. Um, how much time do we have? We have for that um, some some gentle two minutes. In the moment you have your posters, I think we give you some time to like. Um, Spread, spread the um, we we were having some some further pens that were circling over there. I don't know if somebody can help um, distribute the pens as well because post-its are lovely, but post-its without pens are yeah, didn't make you move on tonic. Thank <laughs> you. 